Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of Triple D. So we're back on Effectual Calling today, yep. actually. Yes. So we're going through some really interesting stuff, actually. Steve and I were just saying a moment ago, one of the proof texts in here, I decided just to skip over for now because that is a can of worms that I don't want to pop the top to at the moment. Uh, so it was a Song of Solomon quote, and you go and read it for yourself and come back to us. If you want to talk about that in the office or in a session here at the church, that's cool. I'll tell you my thoughts on it. Steve would be glad to tell you his thoughts on it. But today, let, let's not go there for just the moment then. We, we got some other ones we Hard can discuss. Hard enough as it is. Hard enough as it is. I don't want to have to deal with it while it's <laughs> right now at least. So we'll go back to that later on if y'all want. But thank y'all for being with us here today. So we're going through the second half of Section 1. So we, pay the, we put these into two uh, halves on effectual calling. So I'm going to read the whole text, and then we're going to go through the second portion of it. So, with, well, with no further ado, let's jump yeah. into it then. We read, All those whom God hath predestinated unto life, and those only he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit, out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them an heart of flesh. And that's where we're going to start our section today. Renewing their wills and by his almighty power, determining them to that which is good, and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ. Yet so, as they come most freely, be made willing by His grace. Mm. So, so far, we've defined what effectual calling means. We've looked at some of the stuff that it's not. We've looked at some of the things that it does. We look at the way that God calls a person. So, Steve, one of the very interesting things in here, one of these phrases, is it talks about taking away the heart of stone and giving a heart of flesh. So and that comes from Ezekiel. It's going to be one of our proof texts that we get at here in a minute. So what is what is the significance of that imagery? Because a lot of times in the Bible, flesh is used in a very negative way. You know, Paul calls it the wretched flesh. Mm -hmm. So how is it being used in a positive manner here in the confession and later on in Ezekiel? Well, Jesus had flesh, and there's nothing wrong with the flesh. And so it was just fallen under sin, and so it's got that picture, but it can be renewed and changed, and that's where we are in Christ. Because there's nothing, and, and as theolo theology went along with some of the with some of the bad schools as the years progressed, we know that they started saying that flesh was wrong. Anything mm -hmm. in the flesh was wrong, yeah. and then they said Jesus couldn't have flesh mm -hmm. because flesh is wrong. And First John, one of the themes there is talking about how Jesus was in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And so there's, the flesh can be good. It's not wrong. And we have a new flesh. We have a new heart. And so I think that's one of the themes that they're getting at. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, a heart of stone is something that's cold. It yep. doesn't beat. It's, mm -hmm. it's metallic almost. Yep. Uh, it doesn't do anything. It just sits there and causes problems. But a heart of flesh, it beats. Uh, but flesh, though, determined in the Bible, it's the three rules of hermeneutics, as we're all too familiar with. It's context, context, context. You have to look at the context, and in the context with that proof text in Ezekiel, with that imagery, flesh is not a bad thing there. Yeah. It's not talking about fallen flesh like mm -hmm. Paul is talking about in Romans. They're talking about a good kind. The body is not a bad thing. Uh, regeneration is a very good thing, which this context, which the context shows us is yeah. talking about in Ezekiel. So flesh is not always a negative representation. When it says, I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, God's not saying, I'm going to cause you to sin even more, of course. He's replaced the heart of stone. He's talking about regeneration there, which is yeah. a good thing, a necessary thing. But we need to look at the context around it just so that way we don't go off onto something we don't need to be saying. And a lot of, the, one of the major themes in the Bible is, is the, this false schools mm -hmm. We're, we're really attacking flesh itself, mm -hmm. the yeah. body itself. And, and, and one of the th themes of the Bible is there's nothing wrong with that. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So and there's nothing wrong with that statement here which mm -hmm. God makes. So yep. recall too with us, Steve, the, we're, we're getting at here, we're getting at effectual calling, we're getting at the regenerative will, we're getting mm -hmm. at the will of man in a regenerate state. Yep. So recall too, because we just got done with free will, so recall the state of the will before effectual calling. Describe what that will looks like because that's what Westminster's getting at, that moving from an unregenerate state to a regenerate yeah. state. Well, in a fallen state, people have a free will, but they're free to sin. They're not free to find God. Yes. 
where once we're converted and God changes our will, then we have the desire to choose the Lord and the ability to choose the Lord, where we do not have that in a fallen state. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, man does still choose God. Mm -hmm. We have to preface what that says because we do not take the first step. We don't do anything in it. Right. We're wholly passive in that endeavor. Uh, but man does choose God in the end because God causes us to choose him. So God is the first cause. This is a secondary cause that we're acting upon. And he changes our wonder. Absolutely. Where we wonder. didn't, want, we didn't want the Lord before, now we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what regeneration does. We now want to choose the things of the Lord. We want to do that which is pleasing to the Father because we've been regenerated. Our wills have been renewed. Our minds have been renewed. Our wills have been changed. Absolutely. So, and I, I wanted to look here too that the, we are effectually drawn to Jesus Christ. So, Steve, I want to ask is this call then, when we come to meet Christ on the cross of Calvary, when the Spirit of God is pulling us towards Him, can that be resisted? No, hmm. it cannot. No. Uh, if, if it can be resisted, then I'm God, mm -hmm. and I'm greater than God because I can resist mm -hmm. God. But see, that. That is, you should be thankful that you cannot resist it because mm -hmm. on your own, you're going to want to resist it mm -hmm. until the Lord works in your heart and changes your heart. And then you say, oh, I get it. I see it. Why didn't I want to do it before? Because you couldn't see it. Absolutely. But no, praise God, that cannot be resisted. Absolutely. Yeah, the effectual call cannot be resisted if it's the effectual call. Right. The general call can. We talked last week about Ben Franklin going to hear Whitfield yeah. very, very regularly. Well, Franklin heard the general call more than most people do, yeah. but he never was regenerate, as far as we know, at least. So he never had the effectual call. He never had the Spirit of God working yeah. on him in that matter. But he did hear the general call, which can be resisted, mm -hmm. but the effectual call cannot be resisted. When we come to Christ, when the Spirit draws us to the cross, we cannot resist that calling. And you could put it this way. All for whom Christ died will one day be in heaven. Absolutely. And that should encourage you. When you're dealing with your lost family members, your lost loved ones and friends, and they, they're not interested in the gospel, and you try and talk to them, and they just kind of push you away, that should encourage you. Absolutely. Absolutely. All for whom Christ died will be in heaven, and all who are in heaven Christ died for. That's right. Yep. So absolutely, two sides of the same coin. So, And we're getting at here, and Westminster makes that yet. So it's usually very important when they throw one of those yets in there because it's getting at the obverse side. So they come most freely. So man does come freely to the call of Christ if it's effectual. And we've been talking about that too because God has effectually called them because he is sovereign. We've established that man is not a robot. Uh, you know, we as Calvinists, we get coined with that a lot, that, well, you just think that man is a robot who has no emotions. You believe in an un, unmovable mover kind of thing, the God of Aristotle kind of thing. But man is not a robot, but God is still sovereign. And if he's not sovereign, well, then something else is sovereign. Right. And if it's us, we're in a whole lot of yeah. trouble. So we're still called to choose God, of course. God calls us to do that. But it's because the Spirit of God has so worked in us, right. has called us. So we are still called to choose God. And you can choose God in a regenerate state. Right. But in an unregenerate state, you're not going to choose God. So that's all that Westminster is getting at there. So do you have a will? Of course you do. Do you have a free will? Yes. Is it enslaved to sin if you're not regenerate? Absolutely. You so cannot choose God. So it shouldn't surprise you when you're talking to a family member who's not a believer, you talk about the Lord, and they just kind of have a bad attitude or push you away and say, well, that's what I expect. Don't be surprised by that. In fact, you can come back to them and say, well, of course you're not interested. Absolutely. I'm, Absolutely. I'm not surprised at all that you've got a bad attitude. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised that you don't want to go to church. Mm -hmm. But I'm praying the Lord will change your heart. Absolutely. And it requires an act of God to change the will of fallen man yeah. uh, because he's the one who can do it. Nothing else will. No amount of theistic proofs, no amount of logic will do it. Uh, nothing will do it except for the Spirit of God who sovereignly and effectually calls. So, Steve, with that, let's go ahead and jump into okay. our proof text then. So I'm going to ask you to start with Ezekiel 36, 26. So we referenced this verse earlier, pivotal verse in the Old Testament. Now, this is a major text. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Hmm. Now, notice the word I and how many times it's there. I will give you new heart, new heart within you. I will remove the heart of stone 
can give you a heart of flesh. It's the work of the Lord mm -hmm. saying, I will accomplish this in you. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a sovereign act of the Lord because if the Pelagians are right, the people who think that, well, man is basically good, you can just choose God on your own free accord, mm -hmm. and you're the one who takes the first step, then we're in a whole heap of trouble because the Bible says you can't do that. Yeah. You're in bondage to sin. You have a heart of stone. Well, a heart of stone, just like a statue, just sits there. It's, it's dead. It's dead. It's cold. It just sits mm -hmm. there, and it doesn't look pretty even if it mm -hmm. looks like a heart. So, But it requires an act of God to replace that heart with a heart of flesh that beats for him. So, and that's what Ezekiel is getting at there. And that is a pivotal text to understand in the Old yeah. Testament. And for the Reformed and biblical, I would say, understanding of salvation and of the call. Because it's the Lord who works these things out. So I'm going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. So this is an all-too-forgotten text, actually, because it goes with our text in Colossians as well, where it talks about the circumcision of the heart and baptism being corresponding to circumcision, what it points to. So this is a very pivotal text because this is Moses talking. And for I would throw this as an aside for some of my theological friends, too, who watch the show, that uh, if you want to have somebody say that Moses is not a covenant of grace, take them to this and ask them to wrestle with this text a little bit because it's a very pivotal text. So we read, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. So that is prophesied right here. Mm -hmm. Now, does it come by keeping the law? Absolutely not. But this is the necessary change that must occur. We hate the law when we first come to it, of course. But when God does that act of salvation on us, when he calls us, we love the law of the Lord. We can say, like in Psalm 119, we can say with David, the law of the Lord is my delight. We can say that we love the morality of God when we come to these things, whereas we once hated them. And it's because Moses is telling his people, too, you need circumcision of the heart, not just circumcision of the flesh. Because circumcision of the flesh is just a sign. It's a sign of something that may or may not occur. Uh, we know a bunch of people who have been baptized as infants who are not believers, of course. But we don't know anybody who's been circumcised of the heart truly and is not a believer because that's talking about regeneration. So, Steve, I'm going to ask you to turn to our next text, sure. then to John chapter 6, verses 44 through 45. And this is what effectual calling does. And as you listen to these words, I do not know how people that disagree with us and, mm -hmm. and disagree with the effectual call, I don't know how they can hold that position mm. or what, how do they handle these verses. Absolutely. The, the, Agreed. All right, John 6, 44. Notice how strong and clear this is. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Mm. Just stop there for a second. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Mm. So everyone who says that they know the Lord truly in a saving manner must come through Christ. Mm -hmm. And Christ is the one who draws them to himself, to the Father, by the work of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. So, And you're, you're absolutely right, Steve. I don't see how you can come to those, verse, those verses and not come away with a correct yeah. understanding of the effectual call. You're going to have to do something weird with those verses in order to get around it. Uh, I remember when I first read those verses, too, and that was definitely a convicting chapter right there with John chapter 6. And he gets at several other verses in there, and Christ keeps repeating it almost, too. That none who come, none can come to the Father unless I draw him, and all who are drawn by me will come to the Father. So absolutely pivotal text there. And I'm going to go to our last one, which okay. is Romans chapter six, verses sixteen through eighteen. And Paul is dis describing here the change of the will in man. So he's going, that, he's saying that believers are dead in sin, dead to sin, and alive to God. And the obverse is true as well. Non-believers are alive in sin and they're dead to God. So this is that big change that goes on. When we're called, our wills are changed and renewed so that we now freely choose God, whereas we once freely chose sin because we were in bondage to sin. Now Paul frankly says you're in bondage to God. You're bound to keep his law and keep his commandments and to love him. And we read, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But 
thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. That is the big change what happens when you are effectually called. You were once a slave to sin and foreign to the promises of God. Now you are a slave to the Lord. You are a bond slave. You are a child of God who loves the Lord and follows his commandments. And you hate the things that you once formerly served. You're no longer in bondage to sin. You don't have to sin anymore. You can freely choose to go to the Lord. You can pray to him. You can repent before him. You, can, you have a great high priest and an advocate. You have a lawyer before the throne of God with Christ Jesus the righteous. The unregenerate person has no claim to that whatsoever. He loves his sin, and he freely chooses that sin. Whereas as a believer, you freely choose God because you love God, and it's because, not of anything you've done, as Paul says here or in Ephesians as well, that you choose him because God first chose you. And that is a powerful, powerful statement. I would encourage you all to read that chapter as well. Well, Steve, I think that'll end us up for the day then. So if you want to read us, and this is actually a proof text here, this psalm this time. So if you would end us with Psalm 110, verse 3. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power, in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. Mm. And that is talking about a believer who freely chooses God because God chose him. He's called him to Christ, and that's what you do. You now freely choose God because he has called you to his side. And praise be to God for that because otherwise we would have never chosen him. Right. We would have chosen the filth of the world over the riches of our Heavenly Father. So I think that will end us for the day then. So thank you all for being with us today. So Lord willing, we'll be back next week with another episode of Triple D. We'll continue with the doctrine of effectual calling. Until then, may God richly bless you and your family. Thanks for being with us here today.